1979, I was a graduate student in linguistics uh, with taking a course offered by Professor Ken Hale, who died a few years ago. And the course was on linguistics education. And he said three important things which caught our attention. One, you don't have to wait till college to do linguistics. We can do linguistics in high school. Two, the value of linguistics in high school is not the content knowledge of linguistics, but the ways of thinking that linguistics demonstrates, the mode of scientific inquiry. Three, in order to do that, it's not necessary to lecture to students about linguistics knowledge, but help them construct that knowledge on their own. These were somewhat revolutionary ideas, somewhat insane ideas, but most of us respond to insane ideas. So my wife and I, Tara, pursued this, tried it out in a one-week course for Boston teachers who would then do this with their students. And to our pleasant surprise, this was tremendously successful. Teachers learned, in fact, a great deal of content knowledge that they wouldn't have learned in a one-semester course in linguistics. But more importantly, they learned something about scientific inquiry. And they all said, we, we would now be able to teach our students these ways of thinking. Our life has never been the same since then. The seed that Ken Hale planted in our minds during the last 30 years has grown into a huge tree, and we have both moved beyond linguistics, from scientific inquiry to mathematical inquiry to philosophical inquiry, covering all fields. We are now helping the young uh, in high school, in college, at the PhD level, how to think, how to think like a mathematician, how to think like a scientist, how to think like a philosopher, and the content knowledge itself comes as a kind of byproduct. The most important part is the thinking abilities. Let me give you an example. Let me ask you this question, what is a solid? I'm sure that all of you have learned this, the distinction between solid and liquid. How many of you remember the distinction between solid and liquid that you learned in primary school, not after that? Very few. OK, just about uh, uh, half a dozen. So let me remind you. What you learned in primary school is that solid has its own shape, but liquid takes the shape of a container. Everybody remember that? OK, good. So let me take you through some examples. This is what I do with high school students or PhD students. Take some examples. A grain of peppercorn has its own shape, so one grain is solid according to this definition. But if you take a handful of peppercorn, put it in a container, it takes the shape of a container. Therefore, by the definition that we learn in primary school, a handful of peppercorn, as you can see from this picture, is liquid. When we do this in the classroom, students are, of course, upset. They say, no, 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 that cannot be the case. Uh, peppercorn, no matter whether it is a single corn or a handful solid. So I remind them, but then, according to the definition, if you take the definition seriously, a handful of peppercorn, takes the shape of the container, so it must be liquid. And then we give more examples. If you take a sewing thread, put it in a glass, it takes the shape of the glass, so sewing thread is liquid. And soap bubble is spherical in shape, therefore soap bubble is solid. By this time, students are in extreme agony. <laughs> what they are faced with is a conflict between the definition, the logical contradiction between the definition, the consequence of the definition, and what they believe, their conclusions. So they have a choice of either abandoning the definition and sticking to their judgment, or sticking to the definition and changing their conclusion. And most students say, OK, the definition is wrong. By that, what they are doing is saying that the textbook definition has to be abandoned. This is a very important step in education, in doubting and questioning all forms of authority, textbooks, teachers, specialists. And this is what students are introduced to. 
in this exercise. Of course, this is not sufficient. Beyond doubting and questioning, they should also be capable of arriving at their own conclusions. So I asked them, suppose you have a lake and you don't know whether it is solid or liquid. Maybe it is frozen solid, maybe it is still liquid. Do you pour the lake into a cup to find out whether it is solid or liquid? No, you don't. You can make judgments without actually your visual faculty. You do, uh, you do something else. From then on, students engage in this thought about the question, what is a solid? And that takes them to a certain mode of inquiry, a kind of conceptual inquiry. Let me give you another example. Here are two lines, A and B, and a line C, straight line, that is perpendicular to both. And you would agree with me that A and B are parallel lines. Everybody agrees that that must be the case. If there is a perpendicular cutting through both lines, then those two lines are parallel. Okay, so we can define parallel lines as if the following two lines are parallel, if there exists a straight line that is perpendicular to both. Nobody has problems with that. All right, let's do the same thing. Let's take a look at some examples. Uh, here are two lines, D and E, and there is a line, straight line going through the center that is perpendicular to both lines. So according to the definition, D and D are parallel lines. Now this creates some stomachache for most people. Uh, and so students typically say, no, no, they are not parallel lines, but then they have to give some other definition of parallel lines. So what they say is, uh, two lines are parallel if they are equidistant. Okay, and that works. Where in the previous case, the two circles uh, the lines are not equidistant, so they are not parallel by this definition. Now let's take two concentric circles which are equidistant. So according to that definition, they are parallel lines. Once again, this creates complications. So the students have to change the definition and say something like, two lines are parallel if they are straight lines, which means two circles cannot be parallel. And there exists a straight line that is perpendicular to both, that will work. The other definition will also work. Two lines are parallel if they are straight lines and equidistant. They have the same consequence. Except this, this, they have the same consequence in Euclidean geometry. If you go to spherical geometry, they have very different consequences, and that will be the next step. The next step would also involve asking the question, what do we mean by a straight line? And what is distance in Euclidean geometry? These are extremely hard questions, which we don't expect high school students to answer. At least they should struggle with those questions. And that's our, uh, that's our enterprise. The enterprise here is not giving them the definitions, giving them the conclusions, but helping them to struggle with these concepts, engage in their own thinking, their own inquiry, and arrive at their own conclusions. So that they have a taste of what it is like to think like a mathematician, to think like a scientist, to think like a philosopher, to think like a historian. There are other concepts of this kind that we can engage with. We raise questions like, what is a solid? What are parallel lines? What is a straight line? We can ask questions like, what is consciousness? What is democracy? You can ask the question, is there democracy in India? According to one definition, there is. According to some other definition, there is no democracy, either in India or in the United States. It depends upon what you think democracy is about. Or what is justice? Is justice simply punishment? These are important questions that students must grapple with. Whether or not they arrive at the final answer or not is not relevant. It is the process that is important. But is this process that is actually hindered in our current system of education, where all questions are forbidden? There is another aspect to this form of education. Let me illustrate that with the question about solar system. Primary school children learn uh, that the Earth revolves around the sun and that it rotates on an axis that is perpendicular to the plane of revolution. Now we ask the question, why should I believe that the Earth goes around the sun? Very few educated people can answer that question, even when they are science graduates. So what they are doing is really believing in a dogma, 
If you do not understand the justification for a belief, what you believe is dogma. So what we do actually in our education system is giving students a bunch of dogma as scientific knowledge and force them to believe those things. It usually takes about at least 10 hours of discussion with students for them to understand the evidence and arguments for the heliocentric position. Even to understand the relation between the tilt of the axis of the Earth and seasons, it takes at least one hour to go through the argumentation, to go through the debates. But in standard education, they don't get that time. Students are told that all living species and extinct species came, evolved from a single ancestor species. Do they know the evidence for it? Do they know the arguments for it? No. And to the extent they're not aware of it, they're believing in dogma. So whether they believe in scientific dogma or religious dogma, it doesn't matter, it is still dogma. They are told that all matter is made up of atoms. Do they understand the evidence for that? No, they don't. And to the extent they do not understand the evidence, they are getting dogma. They are getting indoctrinated through science, which is against the very spirit of scientific inquiry. So science is taught as dogma, not as science, in our forms of education. This is one of our attempts to, to shift from simply transmission of knowledge to ways of thinking, ways of inquiring. Inquiry is our focus. Another part of our enterprise, by in, be, going beyond scientific temper that comes from the pursuit of science, is what we call transdisciplinarity. Let me give you a quick example. You can think about the structure of the atom, structure of a molecule, structure of organizations, etc. These are all discipline-specific notions. But the notion structure itself is transdisciplinary in the sense that it cuts across disciplinary boundaries. And there are many other notions like that. Function, organization, justification, theory, analysis. All these are concepts that cut across disciplinary boundaries. And by helping students to understand these concepts, they get the freedom to move across disciplines fairly easily and learn from many different disciplines. To pursue these uh, goals, we need to separate coaching, which is helping students to pass examinations, and education, which is really doing the kinds of things that we have been talking about. We were lucky, some of us, in being associated with certain organizations, institutions. So these are two of my teachers, Noam Chomsky and Maurice Saleh, when I was a graduate student. The person uh, sitting next to Chomsky and Halle, even though it doesn't look like me, it is me, uh, <laughs> several years ago. We learned something extremely valuable from these education institutions, how to be educated. But that kind of model, what you learn from these prestigious institutions like MIT, cannot be replicated in India for various reasons. So what we are trying to do is to bring that kind of education in a structured, accessible way, such that it is replicable, affordable, scalable, in a systematic manner, through a group of people who call ourselves THINK, School of THINK, T-H-I-N-Q, and we are all mildly insane people. We have our own separate jobs, but we do this as a kind of, as our passion, without any payment. We are, of course, thinking about setting up a center for these these activities, but setting up a center like that requires funding and so on, and none of us in that group have any understanding of those activities, those funding, uh, how to raise funds. But we hope that simply through our passion, through our dedication, we will change the nature of education in India and abroad. Thank you.